The theme for this month is seek not the things of this world, but seek ye first to build up the kingdom of God and to establish his righteousness. And that's taken from Matthew, the sixth chapter. And for a call to worship this morning, I'd like to read to you a few verses from the second book of Nephi, the sixth chapter, beginning in verse 41. Oh, the greatness and the justice of our God, he executeth all his words, and they have gone forth out of his mouth, and his law must be fulfilled. But behold, the righteous, the saints of the Holy One of Israel, they which have believed in the Holy One of Israel, they which have endured the crosses of the world and despised the shame of it, they shall inherit the kingdom of God which was prepared for them from the foundation of the world and their joy shall be full forever. O oh, the greatness of the mercy of our God, the Holy One of Israel, for he delivereth his saints from that awful monster, the devil and death and hell, and that lake of fire and brimstone, which is endless torment. May the Lord bless us this morning as we share together. Emma, it's a pleasure to have you back in our congregation for the summer, I hope, and uh, to receive the ministry that you shared with us, like you shared it this morning, is a true blessing. Brother Jerome, I thank you for the power and the strength of your voice, and yet the tenderness with which you praise God. I thank you for that ministry. And Marla, I can't begin to tell you how many hours I have received ministry from you over the course of the years, even when I called you by the wrong name. It's, I still appreciate it, even when I call you your sister's name. And Jackie, thank you to the ministry that we received this morning from, from these four individuals has been a, a true blessing to me. And uh, I appreciate, appreciate deeply the blessing that they have given us. Some years ago, and I can't tell you how many years because um, time just seems like it flies sometimes and, and I can't keep track of when things happen anymore. I was, uh, I'm going to digress here before I even get started, but I was uh, overworking at my place the other day and I had a, a man over there doing some, some work and he said, oh, do you know your, your license plate has expired? I said, well, it can't possibly be expired just this last fall. Or last winter, I had, no, I guess it would have been fall, I had uh, a police officer stop me in Green Valley and tell me my license plate was expired. It can't possibly be expired again. Well, I went back and checked my inspection sticker, and it was two years ago that the police officer in Green Valley stopped me. And so, um, <clears throat> sure enough, it's expired. Um, time just gets away. Just gets away when you're having fun. But... Uh, Anyway, uh, some time back, I'll just leave it at that, we had a, a few classes here at the, at the congregation, and we talked about the scripture from Matthew 16, which we referred to as the red sky scripture. And I'll just read that for you, just to bring, to bring it back to your memory. The Pharisees, this is Matthew 16, 1, the Pharisees also with the Sadducees came, and tempting Jesus desired him that he would show them a sign from heaven. And he answered and said unto them, When it is evening, ye say, the weather is fair, for the sky is red. And in the morning, ye say, the weather is foul today, for the sky is red and lowering. O ye hypocrites, ye can discern the face of the sky, but you cannot tell the signs of the times. And when we shared that, the thoughts on this on that particular scripture, it was really to to bring to our awareness the fact that we need to be conscious of what's going on around us, and we need to be conscious of, of those things that the Lord has told us would come in the days in which we live, so that we might be preparing ourselves and might be mindful of the fact that 
there are those things which we must be about if we are going to be servants of our Heavenly Father. We need to be mindful of the time in which we live. We have to be alert and be informed regarding what's transpiring in the world around us. These are remarkable and tumultuous times in which we live, times in which the prophets of old desired to live. My, my desire today, is, and I, as I was sitting up here before I stood up, I was, I was thinking, you know, my desire today is that we can walk together and that we can learn together. It's not, I'm not here to point a finger at you and say, oh, you're not doing this. But I'm here to invite you, let's join hands and walk together. That we can fulfill the calling which the Lord has given us. That we can fulfill the work that lies before us. In 2 Timothy, the third chapter, we find the words of warning to us in these days in which we live. And this know also that in the last days perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful and unholy. Without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. From such, turn away. Have you ever noticed that sometimes we don't like to talk about that particular segment of Scripture because it's, it's an uncomfortable discussion? It's uncomfortable to think about those things that are going on around us that are not good and not positive. And I think that's some, something of, of human nature because I was thinking about how I react to those kinds of situations and, and I was reminded of back a couple of years ago when I was in school. Um, and, when, and actually, it happens in Sunday school, too. I've been on both sides of that. Um, and when the teacher asks for volunteers to read or to answer a question or, heaven forbid, to come to the chalkboard to solve a math problem or the worst of all possible scenarios when you're called to the chalkboard to diagram a sentence, um, how suddenly everyone in the class head is down and they're looking in their books and, and, and looking anywhere except at the teacher praying. This is one time when we unite in prayer, praying that it won't be me that gets called on. I would, was going to ask you how many of you have ever had to diagram a sentence at the chalkboard, but I'm not going to. That would date me and, and I don't want to do that to you guys either. So we'll skip that point. But the the bottom line is this. There is something that we prefer not to confront when it's unpleasant. And so we try to ignore it or turn away from it or pray that it will ignore us. A brother sent me a, an article yesterday, um, and I want to share part of this with you. Um, he actually he act, I actually told him after he sent this, I said, you know, if I share this at church, I'll probably be excommunicated. So he sent me another article, even worse. So this may be it for me. Um, but it's, a, it's, a, it's a, an article from a, a publication, or maybe an online publication, which is called the Harbinger's Daily. And there's an article discussing normalcy bias. I don't know if you've ever heard of that, but you'll recognize the symptoms when I describe them to you. Normalcy bias and its impact on our willingness to be aware of what is going on around us. It says, most people live in a bubble of normalcy. 
where they feel secure because of exaggerated and unrealistic hopes of either a return to normalcy or their, that their current lifestyle will continue indefinitely into the future, unhindered by the perils around them. They sleep with no fear that their bubble will burst in the near future. They believe that no one can be as wicked or as deceitful, causing such widespread suffering and death, as the conspiracy theorists would make them out to be. Such an errant worldwide view inside the bubble, such is the errant worldwide view inside the bubble, they remain blind to the threats which abound in our current world. And in order to cope with the threats to their well-being, they often lapse back into the familiar rhythm of life, believing that life, as they know it, will continue indefinitely. It's so easy for us to do. I think we probably all do that. We And that's why when, when Christ was, was speaking in Matthew 16, he said, Oh, ye hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky, but you can't tell the signs of the times. You don't want to know, because knowing that we live in a critical and trying time places a responsibility upon us. As followers of Jesus Christ, we cannot be like everyone else. A responsibility to respond to the needs of the believers, those who are seated here with us, as well as those living without Jesus Christ in their lives. I've kind of been gone from, from the congregation here for a while, for about six months, I guess, was the last time I spoke here. And uh, there's one thing I have learned since that, or through that process, maybe two, but I'll tell you one. Um, I have come to the realization that to love one another we don't have to understand everything exactly the same. We can have differences of opinion, we can have differences of understanding, and we can still love one another. I had the, the privilege this week of having the brother who pointed out my license plate to me um, coming over doing some work at our, our place, and so I was out there harassing him and, and visiting with him, and we were talking about our faith and our congregations and the things that we believe and don't believe and families and those kinds of things. And uh, he said, well, do you believe that you have to, do you, no, let me say, put it a different way so it doesn't sound so clunky. Do you think that you have to believe in the Book of Mormon to be saved? Well, <laughs> I'm a little biased on that particular topic, but I said, you know, I don't think you do. I think you're missing a great tool and a great amount of information and understanding if you don't believe in the Book of Mormon and you miss out on that. But I don't think it will keep you out of heaven because you may not believe the Book of Mormon or believe in the Book of Mormon. Now, he didn't say whether he does or doesn't believe in it. It may be someone else he was asking for. But um, it's an interesting question, so I'll raise that at the next board meeting at the foundation and see what the consensus is, how badly I messed that up. But it's clearly something that he and I have an, a difference of opinion on, and, uh, and yet I think that even as I listen to this, this young man talk about his family and talk about the trials and hardships that they've gone through and continue to go through, I recognize, you know, the Lord loves this man so much. And he loves his family. And this young man is struggling to find his way. He 
He's struggling to lead his family and to help them find Jesus Christ and to include him in their lives. Right now, I, I know f there's four people here in Kansas City that I know um, who are in drug and alcohol rehabilitation treatment. I don't think it's because of me that they are, were on drugs or alcohol, but I know that at least three of those people have chosen to let Jesus Christ come into their lives. They have chosen to pursue a relationship with him. They're changing the kind of lives that they live, the kind of lives that they want to live. They're changing how they interact with their families, with their friends and with their loved ones. They're recognizing the difference between having Jesus Christ in their lives and not having him in their lives. The difference that it makes to their goals, the difference that it makes to their outlook on life, their relationships with others, and their hope of eternal salvation. Perhaps some of you have seen the pictures of the revivals which took place on some college campuses this, this year, where thousands, and in some cases even tens of thousands of young people, have sought to change their lives and commit themselves to following Jesus Christ. All of those things bear witness to us of the need that exists in our world and the opportunities which are before us to witness of Christ and to make a positive impact in the lives of those in need. Sometimes it can be a really small thing. Not long after I was discharged from the hospital back in the winter, um, the weather turned really cold, and I live over that away, and uh, drive by the intersection of Buckner Tarsney and Artie Mize regularly. And during that really cold snap, there was a car parked off to the side of the intersection there. And you know that still small voice said, you know, you need to just stop and double check and make sure there's nobody in that, ha in that car trying to live there. I didn't. One of those simple, small opportunities that I missed out on because I chose to drive on by. Not something I'm standing here proud of today. And I will probably regret it for the rest of my life. Maybe there was no one in the car. But what if there was? If there was some soul there that needed someone to reach out to them, and I didn't. I'm going to give you just a very short litany of some of the things that you and I confront in our world today. Some of the things that we together must deal with. And it's not, it's not a situation of of me telling you how to deal with it, but rather a situation of saying, let's unite our efforts. Let's unite our talents and our skills. So just a quick overview of a few of those things. Our military right now is involved in open conflict in multiple parts of the world. In addition, we're making preparations for potential conflicts with two of the greatest nuclear powers in the world. Israel is anticipating a widespread and general conflict is about to begin with Hezbollah on their northern border. And they acknowledge that if that conflict begins, Iran will most likely join in on the side of the terrorists. On Wednesday, Hezbollah announced that if an open conflict does break out, although heaven knows how you, what you consider an open conflict, given the fact they've been firing missiles into Israel and Israel's been bombing them for months now. But whatever that definition is, if an open conflict does take place, 
they intend to attack Cyprus. Well, Cyprus is a little island out in the Mediterranean. But they want, they're going to attack Cyprus because Cyprus has lent support to Israel. Cyprus, of course, and you may not know this, but Cyprus is a member of the European Union. So if Cyprus is attacked, you can see the potential that exists for expanded conflict. Closer to home, our political leaders in both parties have demonstrated that the welfare of this nation and its people is not necessarily their primary concern. Our nation is moving very rapidly to shed itself of all the trappings of its Christian foundation. All of those things which have guided it since its founding. In our many of our schools, and I know I have school teachers here, so please don't take offense. It's not directed at the teachers. But many of our school systems have shunned any hint of Christianity while welcoming with open arms evil in all of its perverted forms. And that is the environment to which our children attend day after day. In many occasions, our media makes no effort whatsoever to represent the truth. Now, on this next one, I'm going to say this, but then I'm going to add something, because I mentioned this to Brother James, and, and he said, well, yeah, but, okay, and this is it. Our legal system has become so perverted that today it would be an embarrassment to many third world countries. And I will, I will have to add, because Brother James is right, within that system there are still many, many good people. And the same is true within the politicians who are running this country. There are good people there who desire to do the will of the Lord and desire to serve this nation. And the same is true in the schools. There are so many good teachers and some who I know their hearts are broken because of what they see going on around them. And their hearts are broken as they see the children come to school from homes of neglect and abuse, environments that are not fit for human habitation. And my heart breaks for those teachers and I admire their willingness to continue to try to touch these lives of these little ones. And in Ether 3, verse 98, we find this admonition. Wherefore the Lord commandeth you, when you shall see these things come among you, that you shall awake to a sense of your awful situation, because this secret combination which shall be among you, you don't have to look very hard today to see evidence of secret combinations at work on many levels in our nation, all the way from school boards to Washington, D.C. Now, this is the other article that the brother sent me yesterday, probably the one that breaks the camel's back, but I'm going to share a little bit of it with you anyway. The Department of Homeland Security has an advisory, or had an advisory board, that suggested that supporters of, of a former president, as well as those who served in the military or are religious, have a greater possibility of posing domestic terrorism risks than other people do. The advisory group is called the Homeland Intelligence Experts Group made up of government officials and corporate leaders. And researchers for the board claim that specific traits like those who served in the military or are religious are indicators of extremists and terrorism 
that the nation of the United States should be more worried about. I'm not going to go on in any further and list any of those issues that confront us, brothers and sisters, that we are called to deal with in our lives, in our homes, in our cities. I'm not going to go on with those because hopefully you are paying attention to what's going on around you and you're aware of those things, not just the color of the sky. As I was away for a while and, and have kind of made my way back to the congregation here, I, I had an opportunity to kind of observe from the outside. And one of the things that I observed is that we as, a, as an organization, we as individuals, we as a force for good in the world, and as a community of people who profess to be committed to the faithful service of our Heavenly Father, we all have to respond together. And in thinking how I might be able to bring that forward for us to examine today, I, I was thinking about Alma's approach when in Alma, the third chapter, he talks to the the saints about, are you prepared to meet God? So I stole that concept from him, and I'm going to use a couple of his questions, and then I've got a couple others that I added on to it. And it begins like this in Alma 3.27. And now, behold, I ask of you, my brethren of the church, have ye been spiritually born of God? Have ye received his image in your countenances? Have you experienced this mighty change in your hearts? Are you sufficiently humble, or does your pride prevent you from working with others? God may have called because you're unable to acknowledge even the remote possibility that you could be in error. And that some of the beliefs or traditions that you cling to for dear life may be wrong. Does our pride prevent us from acknowledging that we may not have perfect and complete answers to all the questions? And if you don't have, and if we don't have them, perhaps God has gifted some other brother or sister with more accurate understanding than what we have. Does our pride prevent us from working in harmony and oneness with some other brother or sister who may have an understanding that varies from ours? And may be more or less complete than our own? And when we pray for those brothers and sisters, do we ask that their eyes may be opened so that they will be able to see the complete truth more clearly like we do? Or do we pray, open our eyes and enlighten our understanding so that we may see and understand the things of God, recognizing that we all have room to grow? Sometimes I fear our prayers may sound something like this. I'll tell you where this is from later, but I, I, I worry sometimes that we may, and, and maybe I, I saw it more when I was younger in the church than I see it today. I think, at least in, in this congregation, I think we have, have come to a, a slightly more open-minded understanding of the Lord and his work with mankind. But does our prayers, do our prayers sound anything like this? Holy God, we believe that thou hast separated us from our brethren. We do not believe in the tradition of our brethren, which was handed down to them by the childishness of our fathers. But we believe that thou hast selected us to be thy holy children. 
Thou art the same yesterday, today, and forever, and thou hast elected us, that we shall be saved. Whilst all around us are elected to be cast by thy wrath down to hell. For which holiness, O God, we thank thee. And we also so thank thee that thou hast elected us, that we may not be led away from the foolish traditions or by the foolish traditions of our brethren, which doth lead their hearts to wander far from thee, our God. There was a time, at least in the church, when I felt like our attitude was once we're baptized, we feel that our ticket is punched and we're on the bus and there's no place to go but heaven. I don't think we feel quite that way anymore. I hope we don't. And I hope we don't see that everyone else is on the outside looking in. There are so many good people in this world. So many people striving to do the will of the Lord. Do we all have the same understanding? No, we don't. Do we all have room to grow? Yes, we do. Do you believe that this group of people right here, although there's quite a few of you here today, do you believe that this congregation can singly, single-handedly fulfill the great commission that God has given the Gentiles in taking the gospel to the house of Israel? Do you think we can do it by ourselves? Probably not. I don't want to be pessimistic, but I just don't think we can do it by ourselves. I think there have to be more. There have to be additional skills. There has to be additional resources. There has to be additional understandings. But that's the task into which we have been called. That's a commission which was given to this church at the time it was restored. Do you believe that when people look at us, that they will know that we are his followers and that we love, have love for one another? Do we reflect that in our lives? And do we witness that love for one another and for others when we have the opportunities to interact with them? Will they be able to see that we do not stand in judgment or in condemnation of others, but that our hearts are filled with love and charity for all of God's creation? Do you know that according to 1 John 5, that we demonstrate our love for the children of God by our love of God and by keeping his commandments? C.S. Lewis has quite a number of really powerful statements, and here's one that I thought was particularly appropriate. Christianity, if false, is of no importance. And if true, is of infinite importance. The only thing that... Let me start that over. See, I told you this public speaking was... Makes me nervous. The only thing that cannot be is Christianity being moderately important. We cannot live our lives moderately committed or moderately obedient to our God. In Chronicles of 1 Chronicles, the 28th chapter, we find these words, O thou Solomon, my son, know thou the God of thy father, and serve him with a perfect heart and with a willing mind. For the Lord searcheth all hearts, and understandeth all the imaginations of the thoughts. If thou seek him, he will be found of thee. And if ye forsake him, he will cast thee off forever. I asked earlier, are we prepared and are we sufficiently humble? 
God has placed before us a great challenge, brothers and sisters. I've had the opportunity recently to be reading a book called uh, Red Man's Hope. It's a, it's a biography of uh, Herbert Case, who was uh, 70 in the restored church and spent a number of years ministering to the Native Americans in Oklahoma on the various Indian reservations. And it's, it's very enlightening to see um, how they responded. And even though he did many miracles in, in the, their midst, it took time. And it took faithfulness. In 3 Nephi 7, it says, These sayings which ye shall write shall be kept and shall be manifest unto the Gentiles, that through the fullness of the Gentiles, the remnant of our seed, their seed, that's the house of Israel, who shall be scattered forth upon the face of the earth because of their unbelief may be brought in or may be brought to a knowledge of me, their Redeemer. And, when I will get, and then I will gather them in from the four quarters of the earth, and then I will fulfill the co covenant which the Father hath made unto all the people of the house of Israel. And blessed are the Gentiles because of their belief in me and of the Holy Ghost, which witness unto them of me and of the Father. We have been given our agency. We have been given our commission. We are free to choose obedience or disobedience. My prayer is that we may unite our efforts, that we may learn to love one another, to forgive one another, to walk hand in hand and grow together until we become of one heart and one mind, that the Lord's will may be done and that we may someday stand before his throne and hear those words, well done. Thou good and faithful servants. May the Lord bless you, brothers and sisters.